Hello everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another falconry video. Today's video I'm going to be talking about coloration, which maybe isn't the most falconry minded topic you might think about. But you know what? I got into falconry originally because of a love of the animals themselves. I love wildlife and birds of prey, of course, are magnificent. They're inspiring. They're beautiful. And learning about them is part of it. I'm an artist. I'm a painter, a sculptor. I, 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 I draw, I paint, I sculpt, I weave, I do all kinds of things. And so I have an eye for beauty. And seeing birds, I mean, seeing birds of prey, seeing their colors, just their their bands, their markings, their stripes, their 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 grace of how they fly, every line, every curve on the beak and the eye and the feet, the talons, I, I love it. I can't help but notice it. So indulge me here a little bit because sometimes we just appreciate something and we don't ask why. So today's video is actually going to be about why are so many falcon species kind of reddish or orange chested? Now, I live in Utah. I live in northern Utah. You see my videos, and I have all these beautiful red rock uh, videos uh, that are, that you know, uh, much of Utah looks like that. Not all of it. I live in the northern part, uh, but I love to go to the more southern areas that are red rock. But that color, that color of red, that rusty iron oxide stone, uh, that is the color that just inspires me and especially on birds. And you'll notice I fly a lot of falcon species that have that coloration. So I wanna to talk to you about why that colors exist because there's some very conflicting things. Now feathers, of course, are repurposed scales. You may not know that, but they are repurposed scales. They're highly advanced, highly developed, specialized scales. Some of them are just used for body covering or for brooding eggs. Some of them are for display. And of course, many of them are for flight in many species. Some are waterproof, some are not. There's all different things and, and reasons why feathers uh, use uh, from species to species to species. And that We already know that, but I'm laying some groundwork here when it comes to feathers because of course birds came directly from dinosaurs. So when we're talking about feathers, uh, th there's a rule that's called the Glogger's rule. Really dumb name. I don't know if it's Glogger's or Gloger's, but neither version is really, really sounds good. But Glogger's rule is this rule that basically, it's an eco-geographical rule. And basically the concept is, if you have a species that has a range that the more um, humid, that the part, so in other words, if here they live in the desert, here live in the mountains, and here they live closer to the rainforest, the ones there, which is typically closer to the equator, the equ think about it, let's pause here. If you look at the earth, the equator gets the greatest and most direct amount of solar radiation that plants convert into energy. So you have year round forests that are growing that, and then because of their off gassing and the, the chemical processes they have, they make their own microclimates. So these are very wet environments. The closer to that you get endotherms, not just birds, but all endotherms, percentage statistically seem to have more pigmentation, deeper pigmentation, richer dark colors and richer reds and oranges. And the uh, kind of the stipulation put forth is that by this Glogger's rule is that the, the purpose of that is believed to be that there are several species of keratin consuming bacteria, many of which are airborne. And if you're in a more humid and moist environment where you can never fully dry out, then any place that is layered, feathers layering over each other, right? Just even body feathers can be a haven for such bacteria to proliferate, which can cause damage. And whatever you have those feathers for, for warmth or for display or for flight, that can cause damage. And uh, in a genetic arm race, that arms race, that knocks you down. Survival of the fittest, you're not the fittest. So having pigmentation, deeper, richer pigmentation, actually at the molecular level strengthens feathers and makes them more resistant to these species of keratin consuming bacteria. So that is Glogger's rule. So if that is true, we would expect that birds, being endotherms, the more humid of an environment they are in, the deeper the pigmentation we will see. Now, not just as a species, we're not just saying this species lives in this area, therefore deep pigmentation. No, no, no. We're saying that if you find a species that is in a more arid environment, that the more uh, a humid dwelling uh, 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 set of population is going to have that color. So let me give you a prime example. Let me give me a prime example here. Lanner falcons, which of course are one of my favorites. The lanner falcons that are closer dwelling to the equator, closer to humid environments, do have those rich reds and rusty colors uh, that I love so very much. 
the the further north you get when you get up into uh, arid areas like Morocco they are pale and almost white uh, and same thing the ones you have in the Mediterranean and, and parts of Europe you usually see them as being quite pale they'll still have speckling but their chest is pale and their back is very blue so that seems to fit Glogger's rule and there have been a lot of studies done about this a lot of percentages but I want to give you I want to talk about a variation because there's totally different reason why this could also be you can't nature is fluid biology is fluid we try to understand it up uh, Alan Watts the famous philosopher Alan Watts said that we that, that, that nature is all fluid it's all wiggly and so we kind of make a grid over it, a net so we have parameters so that we can talk with each other so we can say well this species from here to here is this way and then this is the cutoff but that's not how nature works in practice that's just how we can wrap our head around it. So we make a rule like Glogger's rule and we think we understand things, but there's so many factors. So I wanna tell you my observation. You will see that um, the, the Mediterranean lantern falcons uh, are, seem to follow Glogger's rule, but you see those super pale, hyper arid Erlangii, lantern falcons of, of uh, the hyper arid Sahara Desert, the white deserts of Egypt and of Morocco, are the color of the landscape itself. Now, we also see that, let me give you another example, peregrine falcons. It is true that some of our deepest, richest, reddest peregrine falcons are in very humid parts of the world, parts of uh, Southeast Asia and parts of China that are very wet, like the black Shaheen peregrine, very red, very rich. But you know what? Uh, I'm in Utah, and we have incredibly arid red rock deserts, and it turns out the peregrines in our red rock deserts have a red chest. So this is an important factor to remember. There are selective pressures, totally independent from Glogger's rule. If you are the color of your environment, a, a, a peregrine falcon, for example, is not top, it's not king of the world. There's many other larger raptors that would try to kill it. Golden eagles being a definite. So if an eagle can see them more easily on the cliffs, they are more likely to be able to try to go after and kill them. If you are a really blue-backed peregrine with a bright white chest living in red rock country, you stand out, you glow, you're a beacon, and a, a predatory bird that's larger might see you and try to kill you or pinpoint your nest and try to eat your young. If you happen to be the same color of the environment, you are more likely to not stand out to predators. It also goes for prey. If you, have, if you have these towering cliffs in the red rock country of Utah, and if you have a red-chested peregrine hidden on a red cliff, and it starts to dive down to catch a canyon wren, then maybe as it first dives for the first few wing beats, maybe the prey, because of coloration alone, does not notice. And that gives a slight advantage. So again, if you eat, you live. If you live, you have the chance to pass on your DNA, including your red-chested genetics. So I've seen this all over the world, that there are many species that are that way. Now, when we look at the species of the world, there are some that uh, don't have a wide range, but still seem to uh, follow Glogger's rule. In the New World, the bat falcon, the orange-breasted falcon, and the aplomato falcon certainly are very pigmented and have those rich orange-reddish hues. But you know what? Uh, as far as the bat falcon and the orange-breasted falcon, they live in the tropics. So we can't say, well, do the further northern ones, are they more pale? We do see that with Apomatos. Apomatos go all the way into the United States. And we definitely see a delusion of the richness and saturation of pigmentation on the reds the further north you go. Where the closer you get to the equator, typically Apomatos are richer and deeper in those hues. So we do see Glogger's rule at work there. And that doesn't seem to uh, connect in any way, shape, or form to trying to look like your environment with all three of those falcons. Now, in the old world, we have birds such as red-naped Shaheen peregrine falcons, and also, again, those lanner falcons. Uh, but the red-naped Shaheen peregrine, I believe, is, a, is an example like with peregrines in Utah, just like on my shirt, <laughs> right, that are... They are looking like their environment and they have a genetic advantage for doing so. Another example is the Barbary falcon. Now, Barbary falcons are really interesting because they used to be considered a subspecies of peregrine that was very small and very red. And now most taxonomists call them, ah, they're their own species. They've branched off enough. 
Some people still say they're the same, but you have the same issue. They have those rich colors, and I believe it's not because of Glogger's rule, because they are often in very uh, desolate, dry, non-humid areas where keratin-consuming bacteria don't exist. I believe that, once again, it's an example of looking like your environment gives you an, an advantage. And of course, in Africa, the Tida falcon uh, does not have a wide range itself where you have different color morphs, but we do see those very rich, rich deep hues that match so much of the African landscape. And again, I believe it's an advantage to look like your environment so that bigger predators don't see you and your prey doesn't see you either until the last moment. So these are kind of the two main things when it comes to falcons. Sometimes they go hand in hand, and you can be both. Maybe you have more pigmentation in your region because of Glogger's rule and to match your environment. And sometimes for totally the opposite reason, uh, an orange breasted falcon does not match its environment in any way, color wise. Same thing, ornate hawk eagles. They don't look those bright colors. Now the, the stippling and the, the bands on the chest and everything, okay, in the shadows, you can start to disappear, the shadows of the jungle. But other than that, again, we see a bird with these bright, rich red hues. And even though we don't have a paler morph to compare it to, I believe that the factors that would lead an ornate hawk eagle to having those rich reds are because of Glogger's rule. So there are different forces at work that seem to shape the coloration of these birds. I just love it. I think it's great. I've never seen a falcon that wasn't pretty but I think these red rich hues are so striking and stunning and that's not what falconry is about, but you know what? It's part of what makes falconry itself a richer experience is enjoying the beauty, the majesty uh, and, the, and the glory of these birds because they almost look like they were painted. So um, I, thanks for indulging me. Let me just talk a little bit about Glogger's rule and pigmentation and uh, I hope you enjoyed and learned a thing or two. Let me know your thoughts on some of these species and if you have falcons in your area or even if you want to post a link to any accounts you have on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram or anything, if you want to share examples of falcons in your area and what pigmentation you have, uh, share it. It would be great for more people to see the variation of these species from region to region. So anyways, thank you for watching this channel. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe and as always, happy hawking.